Dr. Stolarski from Doctors Hospital is joining us today and we are talking about hip and knee surgery and revision surgery. So um, we've been getting a lot of email questions today. That's really good. Did you want to say anything before we take our next question? Oh, these are all the great revision? questions. And, and that's what I like about this area. We have very educated patients. Mm -hmm. They're not just blindly following the doctors like in the old days. They challenge me and that's what I want. Educated patients are great patient. Absolutely. All right, after my surgery, will I go home or should I go to a rehab? And that's from Joe in Sarasota. Joe, it really depends on a lot of what's happening with you preoperatively. If you have a good uh, social network at home, wife, kids, they actually want you there, and your surgery's a primary joint, you usually can go home rapidly. But we don't have to make that decision right away. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of people who come down, they're 80 years old, their, their husband or wife have passed, they're down here by themselves, I'm certainly not happy sending them, them home. So we'll send them to the Bay Club or one of the other rehab facilities, and they stay as long as they need to stay to, till they feel safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, with, so, with somebody that is a very independent person, but yet they don't have people there to help them, you'd also advise them to go somewhere or to stay in the hospital a little bit longer? We, I, even if they're phys physically fit or strong? I, I would like them to stay around a day or two more. A lot of them don't want to because the same mentality that keeps them strong and mm -hmm. fit makes them look bullheaded and they want to go home. But if they can stay an extra day and the therapists feel like they're safe, I let them go. And they should be able to do stairs, care for themselves mm -hmm. um, without too much difficulty. You probably have to make a judgment call too about what's better for their mental and emotional yeah. state. You know, if you keep them there, they're going to be so stressed out. But if they go home and they have maybe a friend to take care of them yeah. that's going to commit to being there 24 7. I get this question every day. And what I mm -hmm. tell them is number one, we don't have to make the decision now. We can make it post up day two, mm -hmm. post up day three. And I don't want that to be part of a stress. I don't want that to be a stressor. Mm -hmm. I want them to feel they can go home if they feel good. They can go to rehab if they wish. That, that should be a non-issue. They should be worried about other things like nutrition and preoperative exercising. All right, we have a question from Marilyn, and she asks, what are the risks involved with having the surgery? And she's in Sarasota. It's a great question. And these risks are the reason I don't just treat the x-ray. You have to really feel like you need surgery. So what are the risks? If you go through just the checklist, bleeding, infection, blood clots, dislocation, loosening, early failure, fracture, recalls. You've seen stuff in the paper about the recalls. You know, we're not using sure. any recalled products, but I, I've revised a lot of recalled products. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the risks are only warranted, and the way you should look at it is when your life is suffering enough that the benefits outweigh those risks. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're low, but they're significant. If it's you, it's 100%. It doesn't matter that you have less than a 1% uh, lifetime risk of infection after a total joint. If you're that person, it, it's 100%. Yeah, I just I think it's very important to weigh the risks and the benefits and Absolutely. decide if you're in that much pain that you need to go. But I think also a lot of people hold back way beyond that point that because so they're true. scared of those, yeah. those risks. And that's where family really helps. Mm -hmm. I'll have a very stoic, German patient, mm -hmm. a first generation mm -hmm. German patient who doesn't want to let me know they're in pain, mm -hmm. but their spouse will. You gotta, you gotta do his hip, he can't walk. So we talk a little about, a bit about it. Maybe I use different words than pain mm -hmm. and uh, we come to an understanding that yeah, he needs to have his joint replaced so he can function. Yeah, I'm sure you use words like discomfort, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's good. You see, the thing is, a lot of times when people go to the doctor and they start using these like huge words and people don't understand, that also scares them off. But it seems as though you speak a language that most people can understand. So there's yeah. got to be a, there has to be some kind of a comfort level with your patients, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'm well trained, but mm -hmm. I'm from a blue collar family. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I talk to them like I'm talking to my family. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right, we have one last question here, and it's, will I need to be on a walker or crutches after my surgery? And this is from Cindy in Sarasota. Typically, yes. Just for safety. You may feel like you're good enough. Oh, I don't really need to use this, but you're on new medication. Mm -hmm. You may have lost some blood during the surgery. It's a new limb. You can't really trust it yet. So we usually put you on crutches or a walker for an anterior hip, say a week, then a cane till you feel safe. A revision, Revision can be on an ambulatory aid or crutches or a walker for three months. It was a big, a big redo that I had to reconstruct the pelvis. So typically, primaries, short uh, ambulatory aid, you know, a little bit with a crutch, a little bit with a cane, um, but it's really just for safety. So what, what happens if you get somebody that really, they, they say, well, I don't want to have to use the crutches and I feel well enough. How do you explain to them that they really should be we, using We usually it? come to a, a meeting in a mind. Mm -hmm. well, you know what helps if they talk to another patient? Mm -hmm. We'll often have a patient in their same uh, activity and age category call them and just talk to them. Because especially the Asian population, they don't want to rely, on, they don't want to seem disabled or handicapped or mm -hmm. rely on an ambulatory aid. 
It's, it's, and that's understandable, but it's necessary. It's, it's, we don't want false pride. And also, I, I would imagine that if you're not using the aids that are designed to help you while you slowly strengthen your you uh, replacement, it. that you can actually damage you, it. You'll slow it down. You mm -hmm. are so right. You'll get a bursitis mm -hmm. or a tendonitis, and you'll take steps backwards. So you're absolutely And right. what are the chances of something like a knee replacement uh, possibly even moving out of the area that it's put in? Is that There's some unlikely? Majority, majority, I'm sorry. Uh, majority of knee replacements are cemented. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to they're not gonna move. But the soft tissues that we go through, mm -hmm. they can have a problem. If you fall onto a knee that's been replaced, you can really cause some permanent damage to the soft tissues around that knee. So the ambulatory aids protect you, and you get off them fairly quickly. And what about with daily activities, such as you know driving a car, or maybe even a golf cart? Uh, golf carts are... <laughs> um, you want to keep them off yeah. golfing, I'm sure. The, the, so, yeah. the driving is, there's no medical legal re when, when you can go back to driving. I say when you're off your ambulatory aid, especially the walker, crutches, mm -hmm. you're not taking narcotics. You know, you want to realize that your family members are on the road as well. So that would be another reason to go to rehab. If you have no way of getting your food or to the store, then maybe rehab after surgery is not a bad idea. All right, so w when we're talking about knees and hips, what are some of the fitness activities that people do or hobbies that actually exacerbate these problems? Like obviously with uh, golfing, you're doing th that move, which is one-sided, yeah. it's asymmetrical, it's contraindicated, you're taking a metal object and you're swinging in a ballistic manner yeah. towards, you know, you're twisting your hip and you're twisting your knee. Yeah, well, so I, I, I don't golf believe it or not, but I've watched golfers, i talked to mm -hmm. golfers, and I operate on a lot of golfers. Um, the problem, with what I see with people with hip arthritis and golfing, they lose that hip swing. Mm -hmm. They're just swinging just with their torso. So not only does it hurt, they're having bad mechanics, they're golfing poorly, they're frustrated, mm -hmm. and they're in pain. When we do their hip and they get back to golf, we've often seen, if I have this right, they end up going up in club numbers because they're driving the ball so much further because they're back to getting their hips into the pivot. Same thing goes with knees. If they can't do their follow through because their knee hurts or it's unstable, that's not even safe to play. When we're done, I, th I think that statement I said earlier is, is a good philosophy. We don't want to replace your joint so you can play golf or tennis, but you'll get back to it when we're done with replacing it. Mm -hmm. And with uh, what are some of the sports? Like tennis obviously would hurt your knees the most, correct? Well, that would pre-op, you want to avoid the high impact, racquetball, tennis. Um, we have martial artists. To avoid surgery, take up ping pong. Do something lower, lower uh, impact. Afterwards, you can get back to most of those things. What do I prefer my post-op patients? Doubles tennis on soft court. And maybe let the hard ones go by. Yeah, it's, it's just very difficult for somebody that's a sports enthusiast to do that. So yeah. obviously, if you're going to want to continue playing your sport, you're probably going to need a knee replacement down oh, the road or a hip yeah. replacement or something. I agree with that. And if people um, want to come and see you at the hospital, do they usually use a referral to come and see you at doctor's hospital? Depends on the insurance. HMOs all need referrals, um, mm -hmm. but the majority of people call and the girls will direct them on how to, how to reach us, mm -hmm. whether through their primary or just calling us directly. Mm -hmm. no? okay. And um, prior to coming here to doctors, let's just go over where you worked before, because you were at the Cleveland Clinic, I believe, in Naples? Well, I was at the Cleveland Clinic in Naples for mm -hmm. two years, uh, working on their joint program. That is a phenomenal institution. Um, unfortunately, they ended up really closing down shop. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, I was at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, there's some guys that, uh, John Greeno and Paul Lockie, that trained me to, they took me from a general orthopedist to a highly specialized surgeon. I really thank them a lot. Well, you have a most impressive resume. We were talking oh, about that you. before the break, and also a degree in engineering, yeah. which obviously... Her dad and I. <laughs> yeah, my father as well was an electrical engineer, so I can understand how that would play into, you know, helping you with becoming a skilled surgeon, but we'd like to thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. And our viewers out there, you've been watching Local Doctors on Call, and we will see you next time. Remember, it's your health.